Do you ever watch Downton Abbey and find yourself thinking, ah, I should have been born in the Victorian era? Well, you're stupid. Firstly, because Downton Abbey takes place 11 years after the Victorian era, silly goose. And secondly, because life in Victorian London would be absolutely terrifying for someone accustomed to the luxuries of the 21st century. But let's say you somehow end up in a Freaky Friday situation and switch bodies with a bona fide Victorian. How are you going to survive the London streets? Not to worry. With my extensive background studying history, certified by my 90,000 Reddit karma, I'm here to teach you everything you need to know to survive the Victorian era. Alright, so you just finished your Disney Channel style body swap and have officially transported over a century back in time to Victorian London. Gah! What? What is it, James? My body? What's happening? Hmm, it looks like during the body swap you've received a lethal dose of gamma radiation. Oh, and your hairline is receding. My hair?! Oh yeah, actually two out of every three guys will experience some form of hair loss by the time of 35. Uh, but about that radiation... Bouche! How do I keep it? Alright, weird priorities. Well, really the best way to combat hair loss would be with Keeps. It's a fantastic doctor-recommended online service that offers clinically proven treatment to stop hair loss and improve hair growth. They're customer-focused with a 24-7 care and support network of expert medical advisors and care specialists at the ready to help you with any questions you might have. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or honestly, if you just want to take better care of your hair in general, Keeps is perfect for you. They even got award-winning shampoo and conditioner. When's the last time you won an award? Never? I know. Here you go. Uh, now for the radiation. Well, at least I'll go out with luscious curls. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash bluejay or click that link in the description. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash bluejay. Thank you, Keeps, for sponsoring the video. Of course, Alex, you're gonna have to wait a few centuries until you've got internet again, as you're now in Victorian London. The city is booming from the results of the Industrial Revolution. The air is dense, but the stunning Gothic Revival architecture still manages to pierce through all the smog. It's a city of rapid expansion and expensive projects, starkly contrasted by the overflowing slums. But man, taking in all these new sights is really starting to make you thirsty. So you head on over to a well pump for a fresh sip of water. First mistake! What are you, crazy? You won't even survive a day here! You can't drink the water! Cholera outbreaks are about as common as an office quote in a Tinder bio. The booming population of London, combined with newly introduced indoor plumbing, resulted in overwhelming amounts of raw sewage. This sewage ended up in the Thames River, which happens to be London's main source of drinking water, thus completing the circle of life. During one cholera outbreak, Jon Snow, a supporter of germ theory, looked at all this sewage in their drinking water and had the hot take of, hey, what if we drink water, but without the poop? And ended the outbreak by ripping off the handle of a contaminated well pump. At the time, the community believed in the miasma theory, basically the idea that diseases were transmitted through foul odors. So government officials still rejected Snow's theory of fecal oral transmission, stating, <laughs> Jam's in the water, don't be ridiculous, it was stinky air. And this wouldn't be the last time a Jon Snow's potential was shattered. So unless you want to die a painful death, I suggest boiling your water, or just stick to hard liquor, where the alcohol would not only kill any germs, but also help drown that regret you're starting to feel for wishing to be in Victorian London, instead of shutting up and playing Wordle like a good little consumer. Alright, now that you're properly shitfaced, you're gonna need to pinpoint your social class so you know who you're allowed to interact with. But isn't who I am inside more important than some social class? <laughs> no! Simply talking to a social class higher than yours is enough to get you arrested here. Luckily, it's rather easy to find out which one you belong to. For example, are you over the age of 25 and alive? Then you're probably not in the lower class, as male tradesmen and laborers had life expectancies of 25 and 22, respectively. But let's say you find yourself a member of the respectable upper class. What can you expect from your newly found privileged life? Well, first off, you can kiss the thought of a hard day's work goodbye, because with the fortune your family has built over generations through certainly non-exploitive means, you'll never have to work a day in your life. So instead, you're gonna have to find out how to kill all this free time you got on your hands. Being a person with enough wealth to buy a handful of developing nations, or one GPU, you decide to use your money to give back to the poor people whose blood, sweat, and fossey jaws helped you build your riches. So you buy tickets to next Tuesday's Freak Show. Freak Shows were essentially the MCU of the Victorian era, loved by people of all ages and social classes, except for pretentious people who prefer more refined entertainment, like seances. Everyone from your average Joe to Queen Victoria herself loved to goggle and laugh at all the different looking people performing. These Freak Shows showcase people with physical abnormalities, such as dwarfs, conjoined twins, giants, fat people, thin people, hairy people, ethnic people, and whatever else they thought would pique people's curiosity. Gather round, folks, gather round! For I'm about to unveil the wonders of the world, realities beyond your comprehension, freaks from distant and foreign lands, meet the man of hair. <gasps> 
the precious Piper Pinky. <gasps> oh my gosh, small. And behold, Paul! Uh, I thought this was a freak show. Oh, trust me, Paul's a freak. However, the reign of freak shows came to an end as reports of mistreatment of the performers came to light, and the public was furious to find out that the people they went to laugh at for being less than human were being treated as less than human. But now that you've reached your limit of being near the working class who aren't actively carrying your dry martini on a silver platter, it's time for you to build your social status with your fellow aristocrats. To do this, you're gonna have to capitalize on some of the trends of the time. No, not child labor, we'll get to that later. I'm talking Egyptomania. Napoleon's campaigns in Egypt brought back trade and artifacts to Europe, eventually igniting a craze for all things Egyptian in the West due to its perceived exotic nature. This craze peaked during the Victorian era, and Victorians sure had interesting ways of indulging in this trend, such as hosting mummy parties. Not the Brendan Fraser kind, they weren't that based. Specifically, they held mummy unwrapping parties. Getting your hands on a mummy was the easy part. You could literally cop one from street vendors in Egypt like a pin from Disney World, but unwrapping them required a trained professional called an unroller. Why exactly they had to hire a professional to do some glorified banana peeling is beyond me, but I can only assume that their training involved a significant amount of fruit by the foot. Essentially, a bunch of people would gather round to watch the unroller unwrap the mummy and perform an autopsy, including cutting into the skull to go, Oh my god, look, he's got a brain. That's crazy. <laughs> Fragments of the pungent mummy wrappings were then passed throughout the audience for their, uh, pleasure, I guess. Uh, wh what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> While today we recognize hosting an unboxing party for corpses and disgracing on people's history is the most optimal way to speedrun a Twitter hashtag, the Victorians just couldn't help but satisfy their intrigue. And in their defense, they basically came gift wrapped. But if you need any more convincing on how evil this practice was, the most famous unwrapper was a surgeon named Pettigrew. But overall, in the upper class, you won't need to worry all that much about staying alive. Uh, except for the arsenic in your walls, lead on your dolls, corsets in your torsos, cyanide in your photos, strychnine in your tablets, explosive bits of plastic, kitchens full of toxins, morphine for your youngins, mercury-coated hats, radiation from your glass, kerosene and hair products, and asbestos in just about everything. Good luck! But what if you aren't lucky enough to live the life of a Victorian Scrooge McDuck, and instead, you find yourself living la vida pobre in the working class? Uh-uh-uh, ah, ah, hold off on the booze there, buddy. As tempting of a coping mechanism alcohol is, we gotta make sure you even survive childhood first. Let's put you in a humble family of seven kids and ah shit, four of your siblings just died. What? Oh yeah, nearly 60% of working class children died before the age of five. Good for you, champ, you won the coin toss. I, I need to lie down. So long as it's in a minor chimney, because it's time for you to get to work. I'm five years old. And about time you started contributing to the family, you lazy leech. Without child labor laws, working class kids started working as early as four years old. Now pick your poison, chimney sweeping or coal mining. Ah, <sighs> well, I suppose it's just a nine to five. <laughs> No, 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 no. Victorian children were expected to work 12 to 18 hours a day. Gotta beat out that optimism early. Besides, you've only got that small stature for so many years. Companies have to capitalize on your ability to squeeze in the tight spaces while you can. Now, these are still your formative years, so we gotta make sure you choose the child profession that'll cause the least amount of physical and emotional trauma. There were a lot, but let's narrow it down to chimney sweep and coal miner, and weigh some pros and cons. As a coal miner, you can expect some permanent eye damage due to eye strain from the dark environment, respiratory problems from coal dust, permanent spine deformation due to stooping, uh, and of course there was the occasional explosion or cave-in. Uh, but on the bright side, you're essentially playing the closest Victorian equivalent to Minecraft. As for chimney sweeps, say goodbye to the skin on your elbows and knees as that's all getting scraped off. You'll experience some irreversible lung damage from all the soot, and there's a high risk of death from falling or getting stuck in the tight chimneys. Uh, but at least you can die happy knowing that when Mary Poppins comes out in 100 years, Dick Van Dyke will forever cement your profession as much cooler than it actually was. So assuming you survive your childhood profession, it's time for the big boy world. Now, I know the idea of living poor in a Victorian city is probably a terrifying concept, but don't worry, the Victorians actually put in some effort to help the poverty stricken wastes of oxygen <clears throat> excuse me less fortunate folk for example if you're homeless you can escape the cold at a penny sit up where for the small price of one penny you get to sit on a bench in a shelter for the night whoa now don't get too crazy you're not allowed to sleep here what do you think you are a human you only paid for the privilege of sitting and penny sit-ups even had monitors to ensure you didn't fall asleep if you're looking to catch some z's you're gonna have to cough up an extra penny at a two penny hangover don't get too excited. Contrary to the name suggests, a two-penny hangover is not a charity dive bar where you can drink yourself into an ethanol-induced coma. Instead, it was a rope that you literally hung over. 
Not the most comfortable experience, but at least you'll be the coolest kid on campus with your minimalist hammocking setup. The rope was ideal because it allowed the staff to quickly, uh, dispense with all the poor people in the morning. But hey, maybe it was a good day at the factory and you walked out with four pennies in your pocket, you little aristocrat you. Well, you can afford to be a high roller and head on over to a four penny coffin. Yep. While it may look like you just got shipped back from the Crimean War, a four-penny coffin was quite the step up from a rope, to be fair. You got to spend the night in a nice coffin, you had a tarp to keep warm, and you even got assigned your own little serial number, which is undoubtedly the closest you'll ever get to being acknowledged in your life. Speaking of life, you better get used to this one, as people didn't exactly graduate from social classes. So the only four walls you'll likely ever get to call home will be a coffin at best, or a coffin at worst if you can afford it. But on the bright side, if you manage to survive through the era, you'll get to experience many of the following significant discoveries and advancements. America found its second manifest destiny with the discovery of crude oil in 1859. Charles Darwin published his book on the concept of evolution, meaning that in a few centuries we may evolve past thinking crocs are cool. Darwin's half-cousin, Francis Galton, took this research and started modern eugenics. Uh, which led to problems. Alexander Graham Bell patents the telephone in 1876, a device that changed the world by allowing people to learn about their car's extended warranty. Germ theory would become accepted by the end of the Victorian era, and nobody would doubt doctors ever again. The 19th century saw many innovations in data visualization for statistics, which are used today for optimizing shiny Pokemon encounter strategies. The Bessemer process gave us bigger buildings for more people. Modern artillery gave us smaller buildings for less people. Radiation was discovered in 1896, leading the cancer treatment in Imagine Dragons. The Navier Stokes equations were developed to describe the motion of viscous fluids in weed-out chemical engineering students. And Carl Benz builds the world's first car while simultaneously killing the concept of peaceful suburban life. And those are just a few of the significant advancements made during the iconic Victorian era. So, Alex, are you excited for your new Victorian life? <laughs> you want to go home and play Elden Ring? <laughs> The Victorian era. Disgusting and deadly, but inspired Bloodborne. 3 out of 10 stars.